Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I personally have had a very enjoyable time since I've been here uh, in this town. My name is William Scarborough. I'm the assemblyman from the 29th Assembly District uh, in Queens. And I'm joined by my colleagues to my left, uh, Assemblywoman Marge, Mar to my right, I'm sorry, Assemblywoman Marge Markey, uh, Assemblywoman Barbara Clark, uh, Assemblywoman Amy Paulin, to my left, Senator Diane Savino, and the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, Ms. Jeannie Mowbray. Um, a couple of us here, I guess I should start by saying a couple of us uh, started off with a pretty bad day. I had kind of a bad day, but I think my colleague, uh, Assemblywoman Paulin, had a worse day than I did. Uh, she found out earlier today that her mother had a stroke. And so I think it is really admirable that she's even here, but um, she's waiting for a call from the hospital. And so if she has to leave, I think we will all be understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> and you notice that I have an accessory over my eyebrow, uh, this Band-Aid. I started the day by getting out of bed and tripping and hitting my head on a night table. So I wasn't sure if I was going to be here. I went to the doctor and got a little patched up and I made it here. But I'm very happy to be here because this has been a tremendous experience, uh, that which I've seen. And already for me, uh, some ideas have come forward that I think will be the basis of legislation and policy. And so I want to join everybody in thanking you, Professor Lindsay, for bringing this together. Uh, I'm not going to speak long <laughs> because I've been asked to moderate and I know my colleagues have some wonderful things to tell you. But I'd just like to say in terms of the things that I have done and I want to uh, thank Ms. Uh, Smolinski for talking about the Safe Harbor Bill. Uh, I'm proud to have been the sponsor of Safe Harbor. Uh, and as she said, we were the first in the nation uh, to change the way uh, sexually exploited youth are treated. Um, we do need to do more work on it, but I think having put that in law is very important. I'll uh, just mention one other thing that we're doing, and I believe uh, Senator Savino is also sponsoring the cyberbullying bill, uh, and that uh, speaks to the fact that, you know, there is a change in how children are being treated and how they're being harassed and abused. And so we put in place a bill that would uh, increase the crime uh, for cyberbullying. And in an instance where that cyberbullying leads to a death or a suicide, it would then become a felony. Uh, there's also an effort to try to find out how widespread the issue of cyberbullying is. And in that regard, there is a census uh, that we're requesting that uh, young people grades three through, four, uh, through 12 will take. And um, it's anonymous, and that website is nycyberbullycensus.com. So with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and have our panelists uh, bring some information to us. And we're gonna start to my left with Senator Diane Savino. Uh, Senator Savino is the chair of the Senate Committee on Children and, Fa uh, Children and Families. She has uh, dedicated her entire professional career towards improving the life of working uh, families. She was a labor official prior to uh, becoming a senator. She was elected to represent the 23rd Senatorial District in 2004, including the North Shore of Staten Island, portions of Brooklyn, including Borough Park, Coney Island, Bensonhurst, and Sunset Park. Senator Spino. Thank you, Assemblyman Strawberry. First, I'd like to thank Professor Lenzer and, and Brooklyn College for inviting me, uh, and to my colleagues. Governor, very nice to see you, ladies. Uh, and I can't imagine being on a more distinguished panel than the people I'm sitting around. First, Bill Scarborough, when he chaired the Children and Families Committee, now Amy Pollan. Uh, Barbara Clark's dedication to young people is legendary in the legislature, as well as Marge Markey, and of course, the Commissioner of Youth and Community, yeah. develop, community development is an agency that gets less and less money on a daily basis and manages to find ways to provide for the thousands of kids who depend upon it. Um, Assemblyman Scarborough mentioned that I came out of the labor movement, the New York City labor movement, the municipal labor movement, but actually 
actually where I really started my career 21 years ago last month as a young graduate from St. John's University. I skipped through the front door of 271 Church Street of what was then the Human Resource Administration, and I was hired on the spot as a caseworker, along with about a thousand other people uh, in about a four hour period. Why did they need so many caseworkers? Many of you might remember a little boy by the name of Eugene F. Does it ring a bell? Eugene F. was the child that began the kinship foster care program. There was a landmark lawsuit brought against the city of New York for the way that the city of New York dealt with children who were placed with relatives. Oftentimes, you know, CPS workers would come, they do an investigation, or they respond to a call from a hospital that a child was born with a positive toxicology. At the time, the crack epidemic in New York City was just totally out of control. You pick up that infant, you go out and you find a relative, usually a grandmother, or maybe a maternal aunt, and you say, would you like your grandchild? You know, your sister, your daughter, your cousin, that has a serious drug problem, can't take care of the kid. Would you like to take care of your grandchild? Now what family member is going to say no when confronted with the infant? <coughs> and we would hand the child over, and we would say, can you take care of that child on your own? Do you have the financial means to do so? If not, here's a referral to the local public assistance office. See ya. No follow-up, no intervention, no court intervention most of the time, because the agency was trying to respond to whatever the latest crisis was. And as a result of a lawsuit brought by the Legal Aid Society, a young lawyer, I think she's a CUNY now, uh, Rose Firestein, they brought a case against the city of New York, charging that the city of New York was discriminating against children who were placed with relatives, and lo and behold, those children, by and large, happened to be children of color, equal, de doubly discriminating. Well, after that, the city, of course, had to create a kinship foster care program, and I was one of those lucky young caseworkers. But I was sent to training for two weeks, and I learned um, social policy, and uh, I learned how to use the word facilitate a lot better. You're going to facilitate visits, you're going to facilitate mm -hmm. this, you facilitate a whole lot of stuff. Uh, then they sent me to my location where they wheeled me my case records in a cart. Sit on top of your desk like this. We had about 65,000 children who suddenly became eligible for foster care in the city of New York. And we had to go out and certify all of those homes and we had to find those parents and we had to provide service for them. It's an awful way to run an agency. It was at that point in time that I learned that it is an agency and it is a service that the city or the government provides that reacts totally to crisis. It is not a proactive service and it never has been. We react to crisis. You know, when I've been in the agency and, and out of it, I've seen the pendulum swing from one extreme to the other. I remember family preservation when Bob Little was the commissioner. Remember Bob Little? He was the commissioner in 1990, back when, before ACS. We were in, it's all about family preservation. We were going to do whatever we could to make sure that we didn't separate children from mothers if we could provide enough services. Well, that then swung in the opposite direction. You know, it all depends on who the mayor happened to be. David Dinkins was more pro-family. Rudy Giuliani was more pro-separation. And so the agency swung back the other way. We also react to what shows up on the front page of the paper. Dead children make terrible legislation. They also make terrible public policy. But the reality is, dead children affect the way the agency operates. Whether it was Lisa Izquierdo, whether it's Nix Marie Brown, whether it's uh, uh, Marcella Pierce, dead children make terrible legislation. And unfortunately, for those of you who are practitioners in the field, when it, there is a crisis and there is a child who winds up on the front page of the newspaper, people like myself, or I, it's probably not me so much because I've worked there, but a lot of members of the legislature seek to find a way to solve that problem. So we want to pass a bill. We want to name a bill after some child. Nix Marie's law was probably the worst example of it. So we made it more, uh, we increased the penalties for murdering your own child. It's already a crime to murder your child. But we didn't do anything to implement policies or to help you implement policies to prevent violence against children. 21 years ago when I started as a caseworker, in every state in the nation, corporal punishment was not illegal. You could beat your children to varying degrees. Well, 21 years later, it's still legal in every state in the nation. 21 years ago, it was legal to beat children in school, to practice corporal punishment in school in 38 states. Well, we've made some progress there. It's only 20 states now. That's still 20 states too many. We also have a very difficult time trying to determine what really is abuse of a child, because there are social differences. 
there are <coughs> cultural differences. How do you determine what's abuse as opposed to just discipline? It's a chronic problem for service providers because the decision to intervene in a family's life and separate a child from their parent should never be taken lightly. Unfortunately, it is all too often. Concern is, am I going to be blamed if something happens to this child? So I, when in doubt, pull them out. Then you get before a judge, and the judge says, am I going to be blamed if I send that child home? You know what? Let's have a hearing. And then the next person steps in, the attorney, am I going to be blamed if I make the recommendation that this parent is ready to have that child back and something happens? It is a terrible way to make decisions about families. But it is the reality of the system that we all work in. At least I used to work. Terrible way to do it, but that's the reality. We have judges that have high caseloads, we have workers that have high caseloads, we have foster care agencies that have diminishing resources and high caseloads. We have not yet figured out how to prevent parents from abusing their children. Education is probably the best way to educate young people. Towards that end, we've attempted to initiate legislation that would to, uh, require the school system to create a curriculum teach children what's inappropriate, particularly with sexual abuse. But we're met with you know, budget cuts, and we're met with localities that say that they don't want to do <coughs> any impacts upon them. They don't want Albany dictating how they should educate children. So how do we do that together? You know, I don't like just passing legislation and naming it after a kid if it's not going to make any real change. So one of the challenges that we have is how do we take what we know how do we then develop the policies, match it with the dollars, and then find a way to implement it at the, either the agency level, whether it's preventive services or in the school, where it's educating young children as to what they, what's inappropriate or what's appropriate in the home, to do it in the daycare centers, to do it in the after-school programs. How do we do that? 21 years later, I have no more um, way of answering that question than I did when I walked through the front door of 271 Church Street. So I enjoy these kind of events because it gives me the opportunity to interact again with people who really are in the trenches doing the job, to tell us what works and what doesn't work. And we really, really need people to tell us when we're passing bills that don't make any sense, that complicate the system, that actually make it worse. We don't get that kind of feedback a lot, though. We do from the Office of Court Administration. You know, they are very proactive. They bring in legislation. I see Jan Spank in the back there. But we really need to hear more from the, from the service providers and from the practitioners. Because the decisions that we make affect your ability to intervene and make the right decisions for children's lives and families. So I'm very happy to be here to participate in this. And I hope that you know, we can continue this dialogue after today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from uh, Assemblywoman Amy Paulin. Um, Senator Sabino mentioned that I was the past chair of the Committee on Children and Families. And uh, Assemblywoman Paulin has taken that spot, and I believe she's doing an admirable job. Uh, she was first elected to the State Assembly in November 2011. Uh, she represents the 88th Assembly District, including uh, Westchester County communities of uh, Scarsdale, Eastchester, Tuckahoe, Bronxville, Pelham, Pelham Manor, City of uh, New Rochelle and part of White Plains. Uh, <coughs> Assemblywoman Paulin has strongly advocated for women and children in the areas of domestic violence, child care, and she may be leaving us. I'll tell you what, uh, why don't we go on to Assemblywoman Bob? everything about it, but let me go to the, the bio. <laughs> uh, Assemblywoman Clark was elected to the Assembly in November 1986. Uh, she represents the communities of Belrose, Cambria Heights, Hollis, Queen Village, St. Albans, and Parla Floral Park. Uh, she has been unrelenting in her battle to change New York State's inadequate and inequitable school finance system. Uh, and I'm sure she's going to talk about her ongoing sponsorship of the uh, Office of Independent Child Advocate for the State of New York, whose idea actually originated with a policy symposium held by Brooklyn College Children's Study Center. 
but uh, let her tell you about that. Assemblywoman Barbara. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm able, sorry, right. that was the call I was waiting for. We have <laughs> very bad timing. Um, uh, so I um, let me just start by uh, you know by, I seem a little distracted. I am no. Um, but um, you know, I, I really wanted to come here today um, because you truly are the experts. You know, I, when I first walked in the room, I said to myself, "Oh boy, you know, why am I up on this panel when the truth of the matter is, uh, I have much more to learn from you sitting sitting out there." And when I, I thought further about it, I I realized that you know the job I do um, so often is bringing um, you, uh, who don't always talk to each other, uh, together in the room uh, when a problem arises. You know, I hear about the problems because you, as individuals um, in a variety of aspects of child welfare, you know, approach me with your specific problem. When we attempt to find the solution that would suit your need, um, we, we um, buck up against you know, another system who thinks the complete opposite. So very often I find myself in the position of trying to bring uh, those two groups together to be able to resolve and figure out you know, whether or not we can find either a legislative solution or administrative one. And you know, I've been doing this job now, I think um, maybe February, March, um, looking at Bill because we swapped jobs, or not, you know, not swap, but I took his. Um, and, you know, I was thrown right into the budget process. So, uh, you know, the budget process, the governor had introduced a budget that really um, would have uh, done a disservice to the child welfare system. Um, a lot of the um, monies that had been uh, going to very good programs uh, were now going to be allocate in a completely different way, a block grant style way. And you know, we, we would have been eliminating many programs that were serving um, uh, needs of families historically for a long time uh, that, that would have been um, destroyed. So we work with all of you um, and we were able to convince the governor uh, that uh, their approach was not correct and I'm hoping uh, next year's budget, we won't have uh, that same battle, but I'm, I'm not sure. Sometimes, you know, having been there now for 10 years, you know, um, governors have a way of trying to put back or reintroduce their same bad idea, and the legislature has a way of changing that again. So we'll see. You know, we'll see if this governor is similar. Um, you know, we had some successes last year. Uh, we. Uh, with, again, many of your help, um, you know, we uh, are in the process, hopefully, of um, uh, putting in law a, a bill that would define destitute child. Um, you know, what is a destitute child? Destitute child is um, just like it sounds. You know, some a child who has been left uh, without appropriate care um, uh, by either an abandoned parent, uh, um, a dead parent, or, or um, uh, you know, or, or you know, frankly, uh, you know, a parent who's just completely absent, left town. So, you know, we we have not had a definition, and that has handicapped us to put proper to do expedite placements. So, um, that sounds so simplistic, but um, you know, we've been working with um, you know OCA with the city of New York, and you know, hopefully, um, you know, we have cooperation now from the governor's office to uh, we passed the bill. We are looking for. Um, their approval, and hopefully I can report back at a later time that we've, we've actually had success. We also, um, someone mentioned the differential response program and, you know, what are they doing in the city of New York? Well, the truth is they couldn't have done anything in the city of New York because we, uh, that program only applied to outside the city of New York. So uh, it was up for renewal. That happened to have been my bill because it was initially a Westchester County uh, ask, and so it was a pilot program for Westchester County where I live. And you know, then I later did a bill to expand that to the rest of the state. Um, the city of New York did not want to participate at the time, so we exempted them. And when we just did uh, the renewal, uh, which essentially makes the program permanent, we included the city of New York because they've had, um, uh, they've rethought about, uh, about its usefulness, watching, indeed, um, the, the use of the program, particularly for educational neglect cases around the state. So, uh, I think that we will see the city of New York now um, um, use that program, hopefully, um, and I can speak a little, you know, you have to cut me off. Um, um, so when, I, when I'm cut off, 
if I don't have time, you can ask questions. The third thing that we did was, um, you know, speaking of tragedies, we had a tragedy of State Laura Cummings, because the committee itself is not just does not just focus on child abuse and neglect, it has other areas. One of those areas is adult protective. But this was a child, this was a 23-year-old child. Um, any of you, um, I'm looking, you're all younger than I am, but um, for those of you who are not, you know, I have a 23-year-old, she's still a child. Probably to my mother, I'm still a child. So, but a 23-year-old who just came out of the child protective uh, world, uh, now into the adult protective world, and there are issues there, a lot of issues, um, uh, that this case brought to light. And I think that we still have to go forward looking at, you know, those children who have autism, who are developmentally delayed, you know, who, um, you know, who then go from one system to the other, and are we uh, addressing those needs uh, properly as they transfer from, you know, child protective to adult protective. I do think that we adopted two good laws. I don't think that we were overreactive. Um, uh, and I think that's also my job, you know, as chair of Children and Families, to make sure that when we have a tragedy, that we, we understand the, um, that it's an opportunity, um, because they all present an opportunity. You know, all of the um, unfortunate tragedies that, uh, you know, that since I've been in this committee, you know, um, Nixon Murray Brown and we had twin boys in Westchester County, they presented opportunities. I think that there is a tendency to overreact and to, um, you know, and to do aggressive legislation that is not good. Um, so it's my job to, you know, put the lid on that, and I think in this case we adopted two very good little laws, you know, that this case presented. One, one um, Bill Scarborough uh, um, introduced and one I introduced, uh, essentially to allow the agencies to share information, which they were prohibited from doing. So, um, so I think that, you know, that we did something good. Um, going forward, um, Sorry, I'll just, I'll just mention the four things that I'm looking at going forward and then we can talk about them at length. One is to continue monitoring the juvenile justice area. Um, you know, we want to bring our kids home, um, but that presents some complications. Um, I'm looking at um, domestic violence issues. Somebody, I know there was a big focus on human trafficking and sexual exploitation. That's a lot of what the DV world does. That's my background. I'm going to be looking at that. Um, there's some child care issues, but in the area of uh, child abuse, uh, I'm particularly going to be focused on education of black, both advocates, OCA, the city of New York, everyone has uh, brought that up as, a, as an area that we need to uh, finally address. So I'm looking forward to having some productive meetings on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I did, I think, a full introduction of Assemblywoman Clark. So we'll just hear from Assemblywoman Clark. Thank you. Thank you. I think, thank you, Bill. I think I pretty much introduced myself, too, ahead of time. And, uh, but that was a question, so now I have to, <laughs> I have to give you an answer. I, I have been, I have a mother of four children who all went to school in the public school system in their neighborhoods where they live. And I'm very proud of that. As a, as a, as a parent, I worked. I worked nights. You know, I, I think I did a, a good, job of rearing my children. And, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, my husband would always say, honey, I'll work four hours and, um, so that you won't have to work night shift. I said, yeah, but you'll never see the children. Now, I think we've had a very healthy attitude about rearing our children. And we feel very, very blessed that we've had, we were able to do that with the support of all of our family being around because our family is like a, this kind of a unit. And, and so, I was able to, to, to rear four very productive children. I now have two grandchildren. But I have never just sat back and just been proud of my children. I have been concerned and worried and worked hard on behalf of everybody's children because they are our future. And my 25 years in the legislature has been devoted to trying to see the children get a better education and also to see the children are protected and that they thrive as children should thrive uh, to become productive adults. And I worry about that. I, trust me, I believe that many of you out there and many of the people in, in Child Protective Services are doing a fantastic job and wish you could do better. I recognize that. But I also recognize the fact that I don't think it's working as well as it, as it could be working considering what it costs. And, that, and I also recognize that in some arenas there's a need for probably more money. But 
I always have a major concern about that. And my major concern is, is why, if there is someone outside of the industry and that, ha they, that, that, that has a good idea, it, it, the agencies don't seem to want to talk about that. The agencies don't bring it. They don't want to talk about it if it comes from someone else. And that, that part worries me, and I wonder why it is. So I'm taking this opportunity to talk to people who are in the business to let them know that I'm all open for discussions on different ideas. My post-adoption bill, now a group of women came to me about the post-adoption bill because I had no idea that there was a problem with adopting uh, special needs children and some of the issues that surrounded that that created only an atmosphere that the, the parent, the adopted parent could give the child back. That was a major option that they had is if it doesn't work for you, you can give the child back. Not the pain and suffering the parent are gonna go through who, who took taken this child and learned to love it and is doing everything they can, but because of certain things they can't have as adopted parent versus if their child was in foster care, that, they, that they, this runs them against the stone wall. And yet, my bill was vetoed as a result of someone finding a real problem with the, the bill. For me, as long as I've been doing this, it, be, it becomes a problem. I said that, and I, and I feel very, very strongly about that. And so I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk to people who are in the business and hope that some of the people in the business will talk to me and talk to our chair, Amy Pauling. She's, she's wonderful, at, as was Bill. Bill was an excellent chair. They devote a lot of time and energy but as a member of the legislature and as a member of the committee, I want to do my own thing to some degree with their help. And so my, my, my issue is always uh, one of why can't we just all work together for the, because I could not be right. Why can't we just all work together and do something that we believe will be beneficial to, to the children that we all serve? Because it does cost the state of New York and the city of New York a lot of money. And of course, most of the children in the system look like me. And that disturbs me, because it shouldn't have to be. Now, we understand that poverty plays a role, but we also understand that when, when it's time to place these children, there's not enough work done in deciding who gets children in foster care. Best example is in Queens County, in Bill's district, I'm gonna be quiet now in a minute. In Bill's district, but we all know of a case woman with, the, with foster children. I don't know exactly how many she had, but what we know is two or three of them were killed in a van. Her daughter trying to help her. The daughter admitted she had three different drugs in her system. My question is always, who monitors these families? Who interviewed the families and created and made them eligible in the first place to take all of these children? And those are huge, huge issues that I worry about and I know there's no perfect anything, particularly taking care of somebody else's children. But I, I also believe there's not enough communication going on between the, the people who can make the laws to fix it, or fix <coughs> the budget to fix it, and the agencies. It certainly doesn't happen as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Maybe, maybe agencies just go to the chair, I don't know. But it's, a, it's an issue that I'm glad I have the opportunity to put out to you as we, as, we, as we have this discussion. And I want to thank Dr. Lizard for all of her diligent effort on trying to raise the issues of children and families for us. She's been, she's been right with me and with Bill all the time we've been working on uh, some of these issues. So it's a, it's a good time today to have this discussion. So I hope that we can all uh, come together because I'm sure everybody in this room wants to do what's in the best interest of children, you wouldn't be here. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, our next speaker will be Assemblywoman Mar Markey. Uh, Assemblywoman Margaret Markey was first elected to the New York State Assembly from Queens in 1998 after a long record of service in her local Massachusetts community and in Queens uh, that included work as an economic development official where she developed the first marketing campaign for the tourism to, uh, industry. Uh, in the assembly, her legislation has resulted in tougher food safety standards on the farm 
and in the food industry, and new laws to safeguard New York's uh, children. Her Child Victims Act of New York, which has been adopted three times by her colleagues in the Assembly, but still must be adopted in the State Senate, has focused attention on the state's inadequate statute of limitation laws, victims of child sexual abuse crimes. Assemblywoman Mark. Thank you, Bill. Um, we're getting down to the wire now. <laughs> Almost the end of the day, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, childhood sexual abuse uh, has a horrendous personal impact on the victims and their families. Researchers tell us that as many as one in five children is sexually abused. Most of them by family members or by people they know and trust. I became interested in this uh, topic when a young man came to my home and he was in his late 30s and he told me that he was sexually abused by someone in our community. I promised him that I would try uh, to help him. What I found out was that he was time barred because of the statute of limitations. Uh, victims of uh, sexual abuse are more than two and a half times as likely to abuse alcohol. They are nearly four times as likely to face drug addiction one third of those abused when they were children will abuse other children or their children. Abused children are, likely, are 11 times likely more to commit juvenile crime and three times uh, more likely to commit a crime later in life. Child abuse costs society $104 billion a year both in direct and indirect costs, including the cost of health care, loss of time on the job, divorce, depression, and suicide. And the US Justice Department says that only 10% of pedophiles are ever actually identified. Because most victims of abuse are not able to report what happened to them until they are well into adulthood. We know that uh, the, uh, our current law is inadequate. And I mentioned the young man who came to my home and he was in his late 30s. The pr first press conference I had seven years ago, a couple came to me afterwards and they told me they were married for 35 years and the wife had only learned three years earlier the, that her husband was a victim of sexual abuse as a child. Uh, she knew something was wrong, but she never quite knew it until he was able to emotionally confide in her. Uh, existing New York law, law enables many predators to avoid consequences of their immoral and illegal acts by running out the clock. Taking advantage of arbitrary and outdated statutes of limitations. The Child Victims Act will extend the statute of limitations for these crimes. It will provide victims of abuse a greater opportunity to bring their perpetrators to justice. It will also mean that New York can provide an opportunity for previous victims of child sexual abuse to get their day in court. And what that means, that in my legislation, a, a victim who has since been time barred because of the statute will have one year, we call it a window, they will have one year to bring a civil case against their perpetrator. Uh, this is being done in California. My legislation is modeled after the California legislation. Um, this bill will also protect future generations of New York children from abuse by exposing pedophiles who have been previously been hidden. Earlier this year, I held a public hearing on child, the Child Victims Act. We had more testimony than from, oh, I'm sorry, we had testimony from more than a dozen criminal justice, academic, and victim service experts. They spoke about the severe abuse on victims 
and the reasons why many victims don't ever come forward to tell about what happened to them until they are well, as I said, into uh, adulthood. I have a man I'm in communication with right now, and he is in his mid-50s, and he is not able to come forth and tell the people of New York State that he was abused by a major um, public fi figure in New York State, and we're working with him hoping that he will, at some point in time, come forth and, and name this person. Um, but again, it's taking a tremendous emotional um, strain on him to, have, uh, to, to be able to come forth and, and identify publicly uh, the person who committed this horrendous act on him. The experts also spoke about the economic cost of childhood sexual abuse uh, in government and in society. Dr. Ted Miller, a leading health economist, estimated that childhood sexual abuse caused the taxpayers of the state of New York more than $1 billion a year. He said one single case of childhood sexual abuse cost $230,000. Henry Miller, a past chair of the New York State Bar Association, an author of the Bar Association journal essay on the subject, said that in cases of some crimes, such as childhood sexual abuse, there was a moral issue involved invoking the st statute of limitations. He said that it is wrong when a known identifiable perpetrator is able to benefit from an arbitrary legal cutoff from such a horrendous crime. Dr. Kenneth Peake told of studies of some 10,000 patients at Mount Sinai Adolescent Healthcare Center in New York, where research showed that the age of a victim when first abused ranged from 3 to 17 years of age, and the average age of, pa of the patients when they first told of abuse was eight years and one month. And prior to coming here today, I was at a local school uh, visiting some third graders, and that's children of eight years of age. And I looked at their innocence and just imagined what some of them could be going through and what people of their, their, their age have gone through in their life and the impact that it had, not only on themselves, but on society. Another strong argument for a longer statute of limitations came from the Special Victims Bureau of the Queens District Attorney's Office. The chief of the DNA unit reported that they found 75 cases where a perpetrator was identified but not able to be prosecuted when they reviewed a backlog of DNA evidence. So they have the evidence, they have the victim, but the perpetrator is being protected because of the statute of limitations. And the same thing was a, uh, found out in the Bronx where 89 similar cases were found uh, to have DNA evidence, the victim, and no way to pursue it. In Manhattan, had over 600 cases where DNA evidence was available, victims available, but their hands are tied. We have become all too familiar with the horrendous personal impact of childhood sexu sexual abuse on children and their families. We, are, we now also are recognizing the huge economic and social impact of these crimes on all of society. The Assembly has already adopted the Child Victims Act three times, and we now need to pass it in the State Senate. We worry about children's reaction, allergic reaction to, to peanuts. We worry about uh, toy safety. We worry about um, unsafe swing sets. But uh, we have 20% of our children being sexually abused, and we're not doing anything about it. I think it's now time to pass 
uh, the appropriate legislation and give these people justice.